Hey guys, it's your host, Bailey Cartwright. Welcome to the Stronger Scars podcast, where I invite others to dive deep into the ups and downs of physical and mental scars. Hello everyone, welcome back to this week's episode. I am joined with Mary Votava, who... I played soccer with my senior year. She was a freshman. She's a little baby. And I, I'm really excited to have her on here. You were an OG supporter. And Mary recently, well, not recently, I guess, but I mean, in light of things, I guess, decided to quit soccer, quit playing at the University of Notre Dame. She was a goalkeeper. And she. I'll let her talk about her injuries. She kind of had her own little journey there but ultimately put herself and her mental health first, which is obviously a big topic I want to talk about and took that leap of faith and said, I'm not doing this anymore. So Mary, why don't you go ahead and just say hello to everyone and give us a little bit about who you are. Okay. Hi, I'm Mary Vodava. I'm from Portland, Oregon. Um, I've played soccer since I was like four years old, everything. And so at Notre Dame, my freshman year, I came in with a neck injury that was very persistent and I tried to get figured out. And then the trainer at Notre Dame helped me get diagnosed with TMJ that was not allowing my neck to heal. It was very weird, but it was that was all fall. I couldn't play, couldn't really do anything. It was just running on the sidelines. And then over winter break, I was able to start training again and I was training on a slightly muddy field because it rains here all the time. And I ended up having a bad landing on a dive, my elbow stuck in the mud and ended up tearing my labrum and then some other things. So I pretty much like blew out the shoulder. (laughs) Um, That was its whole thing. Um, Yeah, that's kind of like my injuries and stuff, but mental health was a much bigger issue. Well, I just realized I say your last name wrong. Can you say it? Yeah. Vodava. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Everyone does it. Vodava. Yeah. That's a lot prettier than Votava. My bad. <laughs> You're good. Um, I always wondered this. Do you think, like, was your injury the reason that you quit? Or was it all, like, did your injury, is that what caused your mental health problems? Like, Do you think that the injury played a huge role or was it just something you kind of had to deal with? It was just something I kind of had to deal with. Like, obviously, it made it a lot harder and made me feel a little less a part of the team. But I think the injury and like the constant setbacks were more just kind of part of my path, part of my journey. And I kept feeling like, wow, things keep happening. Am I that unlucky or is this a sign? And at the end of the day, I think it was just a sign leading to me because it was it wasn't just one thing. It was one after the other. And if I wasn't injured, I would get sick like really badly. I had a sinus infection that took like two rounds of antibiotics and everything. And I couldn't do my conditioning during it because I had fevers. So like it was just random things that just kept happening. Um, I don't I don't think the injury helped, but I don't know coming from a place where I already struggled with my mental health, um, the injury definitely knocked me down a little bit. Yeah. I think sometimes, you know, injured athletes, it's easy to use that as not an excuse, but, you know, a starting point to those internal feelings of not being happy in the beginning. And I know like a lot, it's, it's easier, you know, you're hurt, you're not playing. And sometimes it's just easy to say, you know, I need to medically retire or I need to whatever, but like being honest with yourself, I think makes the process easier. Yeah. Cause I knew I could get through my injury and get back on the field. Like I know I can go play. That's not really a concern of mine. Um, just kind of the environment makes it pretty hard for injured athletes right now because like taking any time off for injury or mental health, that's seen as like a really bad thing. And people who are there and constantly, like they love to use the word pushing, constantly pushing and everything get like 
rewards and stuff, which I think can be good because you want everyone to work hard, but it really alienates those with injuries or those who have mental health problems who just need a break. And that needs to be seen as more acceptable and almost more encouraged because it's just not at all now because it's almost like I either destroy my chances of being a starter or getting playtime or I take care of myself like it's those are what it is like I just keep pushing and then deteriorate my life like you can get playtime back you can't really get your life back so very good point and one of the things that you know intrigues me so much about your situation is I mean you're still young and I think a lot of people get that realization when it's too late I know most people I've had on here say oh like you know looking back I wish I would have done things different I wish I would have prioritized my mental health like and it doesn't mean like I want I think it's important to say this like prioritizing your mental health for Mary that looked like quitting that doesn't look like that for everyone so yeah yeah, it's a very different situation for everyone. So I'm not coming on here and saying like, if you struggle with it, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> um, but I think it's very unique that you found this out, you know, early on in your, you know, athletic career in college. So yeah. kind of talk about how you kind of came to that realization and made that decision. Yeah. Looking back at it now, I think it was a long time coming because like I look at my relationship with soccer now as something that was beautiful and started to kind of turn into an abusive relationship for me. Like that's kind of a very negative way to put it, but that's kind of what it became. And like, I have, haven't been in a lot of great soccer environments. Um, I've always had a lot of struggle with um, like team chemistry and stuff like that. And it just, things just kept happening, same issues kept coming up, my mental health just kept declining. And finally, like my junior year of high school is when I finally started seeing a therapist like super regularly. And that started to help, but it also made me realize and like think about why am I even playing? And that full realization took from junior year to now because like over winter break, I, kept talking to her because I was getting closer to getting back on the field and everything. And how I was talking about soccer, I just kept saying that, oh, if I get on the field, if I win this, if I do this, like I thought everything would be perfect. That was my only goal was to succeed in soccer. And I thought that would fix my mental health and stuff that would make everything better. But I looked back and I realized I did pretty well in high school too and club like we won things and my mental health was never better because of that and also over winter break I went and played with my best friend Kelly Moss I played with her just we went out to a field we shoveled it because there was snow and just shot around and it was just so fun and it was amazing and I originally thought that if I had fun playing I would think oh this is worth fighting for like I'll keep pushing I'll keep going and I realized like Soccer wasn't like that for me at the college level anymore. I didn't have fun at practice. I didn't enjoy myself. I just constantly felt pressure to be perfect and everything. And I know that's not the same for everyone. There's a lot of people who go out there and still have fun at practice. And I just wasn't anymore. So that was really the turning point for me, I think, was realizing soccer isn't the same for me. And if I'm only in this to like, get on the field and getting on the field isn't even fun in that environment anymore then it's not for me and that's totally okay right I think it's interesting that you you were almost back to playing and that's when you made your decision yeah yeah it there still was like a good amount to do but I finally had more of a plan instead of all this base stuff and it was in the more foreseeable future. Like in the fall, I was like, I have no idea when I'm going to get back because my injury was also worse than I had thought. Cause I was told when I went into surgery that it was just a small tear and then they come out and have done like six different things on it. And so like, I always felt like I was behind, but everyone was like, no, you're actually on pace. And talking to the trainer over winter break, they're like, yeah, we have this plan. You're going to get back this this semester probably and yeah I was so close and then 
I stopped, but I, I realized like I didn't need to put myself through more anguish because originally I was going to play through the semester out and see how I felt like if I got back, would I feel better? Like, I just thought that playing would fix all my problems. Um, and I wasn't acknowledging the strain that all of that pressure was putting on me, that time commitment, and just all the mental strain that being on, in a team environment puts on you. Like, even if it's amazing, it's still stressful. Right. That's, that's the next chunk I want to dive okay. into a little bit because I, I think, you know, from my own experience, I know I've talked about this a little bit, like I, I'm sure you guys can tell I'm a very outgoing person and like I work well in group settings for the most part. And with a team, there's drama, there's whatever, there's always something, but yeah. team chemistry is a make or break for someone's experience. Mm -hmm. I want, I want you to talk a little bit about how, you know, your experience was being on a team and especially I know freshman year is tough for everyone. Being yeah. Hurt, being an injured freshman is very tough and yeah. not feeling like you belong and like you mm -hmm. feel invisible is yeah. it. I mean, I went through it and it, it was a feeling that I didn't think I was going to get out of. And, you know, I don't know if I ever truly did feel like I was out of it, but just kind of, you know, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was pretty hard coming in as a freshman. It was also during COVID too. I didn't really know anybody coming in. And, and of course I was injured too. And, and I didn't realize that my neck was that big of a problem until like the second or third day of preseason when we were like doing planks and I just started crying. And I don't really cry, especially with pain. I don't. Um, but I just started crying because it hurt so bad. And from there on out, I was just the injured person sitting on the sideline trying to figure things out. And I was also a freshman who didn't know anybody. And how you like make friends and meet people when you're playing soccer is playing soccer. <laughs> and I couldn't do that. Um, so that was really hard. And also as a goalkeeper, a lot of times you feel alienated. It's not the same for everybody. But in my experience and some of my friends' experiences, like that's kind of how you feel because you know, you're in the back of the field all the time, you go off with your goalkeepers a lot, and it's just hard. And also you're always judged on your mistakes, not your successes as a goalkeeper. That's just the nature of the position. And that just adds another strain, you know, and how you think you're being judged by other people too. Um, but in the case of like in college, I just never really fit in with that many people. Like I had a decent group my freshman year, you know, with you, with Kelly and several other people who were awesome. And this year there were none of you guys there. <laughs> and that was really hard because those were all the people that I really connected with. And you were all the ones who like came to check on the <laughs> injured people, you know, because a lot of times injured people are in their group and then the players are in theirs. And that's very alienating. And it's also hard with the, like the injured player expectation. It's, I understand the point of it, but the expectations are much longer for the injured player than like the healthy player. And it was just kind of shocking to me. Cause I was like, you're already going through this hardship. You don't really know what you're doing and like as a freshman, I didn't know what to expect. And then all these expectations and almost like a bit of a punishment, you know, like it wasn't meant to be a punishment, but that's kind of like what it felt like you're injured. So you have to do all these things. And I'm like, what's going to happen if I don't fulfill everything? What's going to happen if I'm having a really hard day because therapy isn't going well and I just have to sit there. Like I'm not doing well mentally either, but I'm not bright and cheery for the field players. Like there wasn't really that understanding of the mental strain that goes on. Right. So. I think that's interesting. You brought that up. I, I very openly discuss how I was a horrible teammate. My freshman going into sophomore year, I did everything wrong, 
But at the same time, that's how I reacted. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I wore everything on my face. I still wear my emotions on my face. It's one of the things about me. And I, I struggled with the difference between, yes, I think injured athletes, you want to, the way to feel like a part of the team is to be treated the same in yeah. most, most ways, most ways, yeah. most ways. But I do, I agree. Like, you know, I enjoy having standards. I like having rules to follow. For example, I loved when, you know, I was hurt and they wanted me to feel like a part of the team. So they would say, Hey, Bailey, what do you think of that drill? Or ask me yeah. a question. Mm-hmm. What I didn't like was being yelled at, Hey, injured players, get the balls. Yeah. So I think that there's a very fine line and I mean, coach education is something that needs to be, I'm hoping evolved in the next coming years with mental health and how to treat athletes who aren't playing. Um, But yes, that's, that's something I've always struggled with because there are standards that I think injured athletes should be held to, but at the same time, you have to cut them a break sometimes. Yeah. And I think that like being treated the same, like you, the injured athlete should have the same expectation to be like paying attention to the drill, you know, and doing that stuff. But all the ones about being like overly supportive, like all the stuff that only fall under the injured athletes, like column, that doesn't make sense. It needs to be both sides. So I don't think there should be like that separate expectation and especially the go get the balls. That was always so demoralizing to me. And I never thought something that little would have that big of an impact, but it's, I'm just a ball shagger. And like, I'm in the middle of doing my workout and they say injured players get the balls. And I'm like, I can, I thought I was doing my workout and they're like, no, go shag. So it's like that small act that they could do themselves was more worth it than my actual plan and therapy that I'm doing on the sideline right then so it was just makes you feel a little less than I I really appreciate your honesty because you know we're not speaking negatively about no we don't need to drop anything we're not speaking negatively about anything we're trying to make changes we're trying to help help these little things that like you said it didn't seem like a big deal you didn't think it would be something you got upset about and I I would cry sometimes when I felt just like, like you said, a ball shagger. So I appreciate you for being honest about it because yeah, no one talks about it. Everyone yeah. just assumes that's the way it should be. Yeah. It's not just ragging on the environment or people. It's being honest about how it affected us so they can learn and more people can learn so other people don't go through the same experiences because I know that wasn't their intention um and I don't think that a lot of coaches understand the impact of their words to injured players because or just general players for that matter but especially injured players because we already feel like we're a step down from everybody else. We already feel like we're behind in getting on the field and everything. So we're overanalyzing what the coach thinks about us. So like, it's just, it's weird because you don't know what you do as an injured player, if that'll impact what happens when you're healthy. You don't know how you act, what that'll do or what the coach thinks of you. It's just, it's a hard situation. I love what you said about, you know, the expectations shouldn't change for injured athletes. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sorry, but if, if people who are healthy and, you know, can play, if they're not checking in on me, smiling at me, asking Mm -hmm. how rehab's going, cheering me on, like, you know, why, why is it because I'm down, I need to pick everyone else up. Yeah, exactly. And it was strange to me that there were even those expectations written down on paper because I was like, isn't this a given? Like, doesn't, isn't, shouldn't this be just for everyone to assume to do this, to be a good teammate, to want to check in on people, to want to encourage and all these things. And I think that also kind of like played a factor in me feeling like soccer wasn't fun anymore, which Like in college, yes, it is much more intense and everything is basically a job, but you still have to have fun. Like that's the reason that you play. 
so just that kind of I think that also started kind of my journey down that line of thinking right. so how do you how would you kind of sum, sum up your team experience lonely like what, what was it what was it that what was it that made you feel lonely um people wouldn't really check in like when I announced to the team that I was quitting and leaving I got I think two messages three and I have a friend on the team who I talked to in class but I got two messages out of what like 30 players and that really hurt but that was at the end and it kind of made me feel more solidified in my decision but I just never fit in like people would go do things on off days and I was never invited and like just standing around before practice I would try to go stand to people and conversations would stop sometimes and it was like having been injured I was I missed the part where everyone made all these connections and now that I was here to finally like try and like be with people it was too late kind of and I wasn't even really seen as a player anymore and it was just difficult and constantly being on the sidelines doing my own thing that was really hard and like leaving practice to go lift it was nice to get it done at the same time but the team never sees me so why would I be seen as like a teammate at that point you know and all the all the players like they have so much other stuff going on why would they like care you know so it was just really hard and clicks are a problem for every age group every it doesn't change when you get to college really in my experience some places it might but it happens you know you find people who think like you and yeah you have enough going on so that just happens well I appreciate you for being honest because mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's reality. And it's something yeah. that, you know, when you're being recruited to go somewhere, you <laughs> shine it up and you make it all. Oh up. yeah. Everything. <laughs> it's a reality. And, you know, some, some people get it and some people don't. And yeah. And a lot of people try to like idealize the experience and say it was so amazing and all this stuff. And you can have one person saying that and then you can have another person who doesn't feel that way either so both points of view are equally valid like there's some people who had a great experience had awesome friends like i'm very happy for them that just wasn't my experience and it's not really anyone's fault it just needs to be talked about more so we're more aware of it and see what we can do to make everyone have that like amazing experience and not have people left behind so what what do you think finally how did you gain the courage and the comfort? I think one of the hardest things I always struggled with was feeling comfort in my decisions and like, like I made the correct decision. So what kind of gave you that push that you felt comfortable making that really hard decision? Um, it was a lot of talks with my parents and also just talking to my girlfriend and realizing that the people around me would support me no matter what. And it was still really hard. I don't think that decision would ever be easy. Um, and especially with my parents, they would support me no matter what, but these are also people who have given their lives to me in this sport. Like my mom would drive me to Seattle three hours away for practice every week. I wanted so, to talk about yeah. that relationship because I, I could talk about pa the parent relationship with an athlete until I'm blue in the face because yeah. they put so, like, how can you not expect them to be invested when they literally put so much time, money, and effort yeah. into it? Because for like 90% of your journey before you go to college, they're the ones driving you everywhere. And also the whole time, they're the ones paying for it too. Right. So it was really hard for that. And I felt a lot of, uh, like duty to them to do this and to make it big you know and 
that's another thing in sports you're always taught like you go to college and then you go pro like that's what you do especially if you're good like that's the only path to take it's not you can be good enough and decide to not do it because it's not right for you that's not really talked about so I always felt like it was something I had to do and I thought if I quit everyone would just look at me as wasted potential which is something I'm still struggling with um but I don't know. It was just <clears throat> talking to people, realizing there's more to life than soccer. That was a big thing. And this is cliche, but like meeting my girlfriend kind of changed that for me because I realized like I finally had someone who was like making life fun. And that's what soccer used to do. And so it was kind of cool. I realized <clears throat> this soccer relationship isn't my whole life. There is more out there. And I got exposed to more things and that really changed a lot for me. And so I started thinking more like, okay, if I'm not an athlete, what would life look like? And I realized how much more time I would have. I could actually eat during the day. A lot of times I wouldn't eat until after practice because I'd go to school like 9.30 to 3.15 and then I'd go to treatment right after that and have no time to eat. And then I'd be sprinting at practice just doing conditioning the whole time since I was injured and I'd like pray that I didn't pass out that day and that was a daily thing and so <clears throat> it was just taking a step back like connecting with my family and my relationships and taking a step back and actually looking at the effect that soccer was having on my life. Did you did you struggle I know you said like you know feeling like lost potential but did you and do you still struggle with feeling like a disappointment I do I definitely do and especially when I like posted it on Instagram telling people that I quit I was nervous about judgment I would get and everything because it's oh she didn't have what it takes she couldn't handle it and everything and it's like I could have handled it but I didn't want to put myself through that and that's perfectly okay and I feel like there's this kind of like I don't know like stigma against the word quit mm -hmm. and it's all all the motivational speeches I would watch before games as a kid it's always like push through keep fighting it like Rocky it's it matters the amount of times you get up all this stuff and I always viewed it as oh, I just need to keep fighting even though I'm miserable. And when I succeed in soccer, I'll feel better. Like I said before, like if I win, I'll feel better. And then like after I finally quit, I saw this video that said like, you have to start telling yourself like, why not me? Why not me? And I realized like, I always thought about like, why not me being the starter? Why not me winning this? And then I took a step back and realized I'm like, why not me be happy? Like, why can't I be the one that's happy? Why can't I have like a fulfilled life without soccer? And it, it, like that mental shift kind of changed everything for me. And I realized like I was putting soccer before absolutely everything and putting that before feeling fulfilled within yourself is not good. Like those need to go hand in hand. And I know for a lot of people they do. And that's great. But for me, they were two separate things at that point. And when I realized that, I realized it was time to go. I needed to quit. I needed to find something else because like soccer wasn't it anymore. And it was going to be really hard to have everyone think that I'm a quitter and that I just couldn't take it. And I was weak and just didn't want to put in the work. Like those are all the things I thought in my head. I don't know if people actually said that, um, but it was really hard. And I still have like some struggle with that. Like I came home for spring break and I saw all the pictures my parents had of me like playing soccer and all this stuff. And I just, I don't know. I need to not idealize winning as the end all be all and ultimate happiness. Cause that honestly lasts for a day, maybe two, okay. but your mental health and feeling at peace within yourself and not at war that lasts a lot longer. Right. Well, what, let's talk a little bit about mental health specifically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as much as you'd like to share about your struggles, yeah. feel free, but I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm in, I think people would be interested to hear a little bit about 
how I mean you said that ultimately is what made your decision to yeah to quit so I think people would be interested to hear a little bit more about what that exactly looked like for you yeah so I've had a long struggle with mental health um I've struggled with self-harm addiction and all kinds of things I have diagnosed depression and anxiety and now PTSD and it's a lot, especially with soccer, because you're at war with yourself every day and you have enough strain just from your brain having like a different balance of chemicals and everything. And then you add on all the pressure of being an athlete and not being able to take a break. And there's really no time for self-care when you're an athlete either. So that all just really stacked up. And like, I really struggled with it in, in high school, that's when I finally started seeing the therapist regularly, which was fantastic. Like, highly recommend to everybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I was on a lot of different medicines, and that was hard in its own because they have different side effects, and you don't know which ones are going to tank you. And that happened the spring of my freshman year. I got on a new medicine, and it tanked my mental health. And I was also dealing with an injury, and I was also trying to like heal and get back on the field and be a good teammate but I was also dealing with all these medications and there was no coherence between that medical journey my injury medical journey and then my environment with soccer there was nothing connecting the three of those which I think like oh what is it called it's like congruence of care like having all of those connected is so important because they're not all but expectations should be changed based on what else is going on because you don't have a lot to give. So if you keep these same expectations, it'll lead you feeling like a failure for taking time for your mental health. And that's how I felt a lot. And especially this fall, uh, during preseason, right before our first game, I checked myself into a like mental health facility, a psychiatric ward. And because I didn't feel safe. I did not feel safe with myself. Um, I was having really strong urges to harm myself again. And honestly, I was having a lot of suicidal thoughts. And I actually had attempted in the spring. It was unsuccessful, obviously. <laughs> um, and I felt myself going down that road again. And it was so hard to check myself in. And my only real concerning thought when I was checking myself in was what's going to happen with soccer? Are they going to be mad that I'm gone for like three days? Like, oh, what's going to happen with that? Like, what's the team going to think? Those were my thoughts. It wasn't, wow, I'm literally taking a huge step to save myself and I'm recognizing that I need help and that it's okay to ask for help it was more worried. And when I got there and started getting checked in, they take your phone and everything and so and your keys. So then once you're there, you're there. And I started getting all this anxiety and I wanted to leave and not like go in anymore because I was so anxious about soccer and what would happen with that. And I'm so thankful they locked everything so I couldn't leave because I knew I needed it. But soccer caused all this like second thoughts and um the team didn't know that I checked myself in and then they had their first game and everyone was like wondering <laughs> where I was and I had like texts about that later um and ultimately the coaches were great about it which I appreciated and the team was very good too I told everyone what happened like I didn't feel like I had to but I felt like I should tell them like you don't owe anyone a story about your mental health like you do not owe anyone an explanation when you take care of yourself for that I just felt like I needed to and it would make me feel better if I told them um so that was really hard and then just it constantly got harder <laughs> um I'm very happy I went went in and saved myself then but I knew generally the road I was headed down if I continued to play soccer because I just thought it was going to be a loop because I had attempted in the spring and then 
check myself in so I wouldn't do it in the fall. And then I just felt like it was going to keep going and going because nothing was really changing, even though soccer was and I was getting closer to be on the field and those were successes. I just felt like I was in quicksand and it was just going to eventually give out. Well, thank you literally so much for sharing because, you know, I obviously know that wasn't easy and it's not easy to relive it and talk about it yeah um I think if you don't mind talking about this I think this would be really helpful for some people to hear um if you can just kind of talk about you know that transition from being at home being in high school Mm -hmm. and you know even though mental health is something you deal with on your own like you have people there to help you get resources, to help you do things. Mm -hmm. What was that like to go and check yourself in somewhere and to, you know, have to deal with it as an adult? It was honestly terrifying. Um, But I had the tools, thanks to Rachel, our old athletic trainer. God bless her, because she had, she knew I was struggling in the spring and had given me places to go she had even offered to take me and like gave me addresses so I could just look back if I ever needed it Mm -hmm. and it ended up being in the fall when I needed to and that was months later and so like even if you don't think you'll need it at the moment it's so good to have it because I don't know what would have happened because the stress of looking for a place knowing if it's good all that stuff is super stressful but I was able to just look and drive myself there because she had given me that resource. And also my parents, I have to thank them so much because they told me, like, do what you have to do to take care of yourself. And my mom constantly told me, I don't care like what you have to do. Like, don't worry about the cost because that was another concern I had. She's like, just make sure you're safe. And she ended up flying out and like being there for me once I got out and everything, which was great. Um, But just talking to people is the hardest thing, but the best thing you can do. And I always, always thought I'd be judged. Always thought I'd be judged. But every time I asked for help and reached out to someone, I was not. And people were grateful and it was really a sign of strength within yourself to ask for help because like you want to save yourself. You need to care enough about yourself to do that. And at times I really didn't, I didn't at all, but I had all these people telling me that they cared for me and wanted me to keep going that at first I did it because I owed it to them. And then I realized I owed it to myself as well. And that was a difficult journey, but I'm so thankful for everyone in my life. Yeah, well, I hope you know, like, truly how brave that is, because I, I can't imagine how hard, you know, going through those things, feeling alone, like, Mm -hmm. I mean, you should be really proud of yourself. And I think this is a good bridge into I obviously like, I'm not gonna be done talking about Katie Meyer, like, yeah, we have to talk about these things, because it is happening Mm -hmm. more than it should. And, you know, kind of talk about, you know, when you found out, I know, you have some contacts with her and yeah, I didn't know her at all. And it hit, it hits you because it's real. And it's yeah. someone who's just like you, a soccer player, a college athlete, it's someone who, you know, that could easily have been any of us. And, you know, that's yeah. been you and just, mm-hmm. you know, what was that kind of being brought to light? Like for you? It was really hard. Like I didn't even know her that well. I think I had, met her once I have known people who've known her like I I wasn't very close but I had to call out a class that day and the next day I had to call off work too because I was so internally rattled by it um and actually last year I had written a paper about this called like playing through the pain mental health in college athletics and it talked about this problem and I had statistics about this and the lack of resources. And like, I went through a similar thing and it was honestly just 
terrifying and really hard to process because honestly that was the reason why I decided to quit like it hadn't happened yet when I decided to quit but I knew that if I kept doing the same thing that I had been doing that was probably going to be me because I had already attempted once and then I went into a, a facility and I just I knew I didn't have it in me to check myself in again and it also just broke my heart because I understand how it can feel to know think that that's your only option and think that you can't keep going and that like I, I always thought like oh if soccer is not working out nothing else will or like oh if I win everything will be solved and then when I saw Katie Katie was always like my favorite goalkeeper in college she was incredible and she did all those things she won she was successful I think she was the best goalkeeper in the country like I she was all of those things but that doesn't fix you yeah. and you think if you're broken with those things then it isn't worth living like the, at least in my experience I can't speak for how she felt or what happened but that was just how I saw it and it just scared me so much because we don't see quitting as an option we don't see taking a break as an option and it should be because like I said you can get playtime back you cannot get your life back right and just it just broke my heart because it's just so sad that you feel like that's the only option and that's the point you get to and it was also hard for me because um I learned that she was an RA and I know RAs are trained in like what resources to go to and it was really heartbreaking to me that she probably knew the resources to go to but either they didn't work, it wasn't a priority, she didn't have time, like all these other things could have happened. Like there's a million reasons that like came before, you know, her mental health, like with that, like it's just, it's really hard. And it scared me because I was seeing everyone I've ever played soccer with post about it. And I realized how small the soccer community is. Yep. And it terrified me because I'm like, you don't know who's going to be next. And it's really sad, but you know that there's probably going to be a next one because right. it happens all the time. Well, one of the things when we talk about suicide and why I'm so grateful that you brought up your own journey with it is because a while back I had the Helenskis on who their son was Tyler Helensky, who was a quarterback and died by suicide. And one of the things that we talked about in the episode was that people are afraid to talk about it. You hear the word suicide yeah. and you shut down. You think mm -hmm. it's a negative thing, which great. No one wants to talk about suicide. I understand that, but it it's such a reality. It's something yeah. that, you know, I think the mainstream media, we go on and on about how mental health is being talked about more and more. Mental health is being brought to light. Is it? Because I feel like if anything, we're losing more people. We're losing yeah. athletes to this, mm -hmm. this sickness, this disease and yeah. it's scary because how do you grow awareness when people there's a stigma around talking about it yeah and talking about it seems like an attention grab yep. sometimes and it's that's not it like when I see other people talk about their mental health I'm like oh this is a normal thing and that was another thing when I saw what happened to Katie I was like this really is a normal thing. It's my situation wasn't isolated. Yours isn't, everyone's isn't. It's pretty common and widespread, which is terrifying, but we don't know that. Right. Like, and it's not accepted because if it were, the structures of like the team would be different. You know, the expectations would be different. It would be more acceptable to go seek mental health care. Like I talked about in my essay, due to the physical nature of sports, like, 
your mental side, like getting care for mental health, it's not as prioritized. Like if I want to go get my ankle taped or checked out, I just text my trainer and go. If I want to get a mental health appointment, I have to fill out a bunch of paperwork, make accounts on new sites and stuff to get it. I have to find which um, provider is for my team. I have to schedule the, with that provider who usually has like two or three other teams because there isn't one per team like there is a trainer. And then I have to fill out more forms. And the first session isn't even about my issue. Right. And it usually takes a long time to even get in at that point. And when you're an athlete and you already have all these like stressors and time commitments and you're a student and you have assignments and you have all these things, you don't even have time in the day to eat. You're not going to have time to go through that whole process. So I think like we need to change everything about that because it is way more widespread than we think. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think mental health is more common than ankle injuries in athletes, but you know, you can't see it. Like I, I think this, this is my last point, but I, you know, for those of you who listen, you know, continuously to the, to the podcast, I decided that, you know, that sports psych journey that I was on wasn't for me. And one of the biggest reasons why I made that decision was because as much as I think it is a helpful resource and it is, it helped me a ton. I know it helps a bunch of people. A lot of times in the mental health field, one of the things that I struggle with is sometimes I feel like they just search for a diagnosis. They just figure what box can I check this person in? So then we can get them, you know, on medications that we're not even exactly sure if they're going to work for them, or we can just let them feel comforted in a diagnosis. And sometimes obviously people do have diagnoses. It's a real thing. Like I am the biggest believer in that. But sometimes people just need to talk. They just need to talk to someone who has nothing at stake in their lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was going into these classes and learning more about these things, I'm like, what happened to sharing our experiences, just talking? Like, why do we have to go into, oh, schizophrenia? Oh, it's depression. Why can't we just let people talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so difficult too, because it's not an immediate fix. A lot of physical injuries, you have a timeline. You see it and you see it healing. Mental health is not that way. And especially with sports, it's a physical thing, but it's also very mental, but you don't see the mental side. And you you expect to get fixed with one session, two sessions, but it needs to be more accepted to be an ongoing thing because it honestly can change on the daily by what happens in your life. And like you said, people just need to be allowed to talk Mm -hmm. about whatever they want. And especially about mental health and it not be seen as an attention grab or anything. They just need to be kinder and just understanding. Right. Well, my last closing thought for you is just tell everyone where you are now. Like what, you know, how are you doing? How is life without soccer? What, what advice would you give to someone who may be going through something similar, maybe thinking about going through something similar, just kind of like, what's your headspace like? Honestly, it's night and day. Uh, I 1000% know that this was the right decision. And I was on the fence after I did it. I, it wasn't immediate. And it's a grieving process. Like there were some nights where I was crying that I quit. And second guessing myself and everything but now I have taken time for myself today was actually the first day in a few months that I had even stepped on a soccer field and it was just to take a photo (laughs) Um, and I honestly just feel so much better I'm taking time to like acclimate myself and I'm gonna take a little bit before I go back to soccer like play club or something I'm giving myself some space from that for now, but I'm just exploring life. Like I have time to do things. I have time to go to the dining hall and eat. Um, I I have time to take a photography class, which I've always wanted to do. And I can just explore all these things and just find out more about myself and what I enjoy and how I want to define myself instead of trying to define myself as this 
soccer player, you know, because you are more than that. You are a person who plays soccer. Like, you're a person who is an athlete who also plays soccer. Like, there's so many other things to you than just what is expected of you in the sports world. Like, there is so much to the world beyond that, and I'm just excited to explore all of it. I want to try winter sports in the winter because before I couldn't really do that because I didn't want to get injured for soccer. But there's just a whole new world and I'm allowing myself to kind of live and be myself, which is awesome. And I just, I feel like I can breathe again, which has been amazing. Well, it's, I'm really glad to hear that. I know I got to see a little bit of your journey in person and it's hard. And I think, you know, I know you went through your stuff and you came out on the other end and you came out stronger and, you know, it doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's cliche, but it's true. It's true. Yeah. And it honestly was all because I finally took a step back and decided to start investing in myself instead of investing in what I thought other people wanted me to do. Like I thought my parents wanted me to do that. My coaches, my teammates, everyone just wanted you to keep pushing, keep doing that. But honestly, people who love you, they want you to be safe and they want you to be healthy. And that applies to your mental health too. Like you don't have to be happy because that's like a hard word. You can't constantly be happy. There are ups and downs, but be stable, be healthy. Like (laughs) take time for yourself if you need it. Like reach out, find a resource. I know it takes a lot of energy, but if you can't have the energy to do that, I know there's those days, then just talk to somebody. It doesn't matter who, just talk to someone, anyone who will listen and just start prioritizing yourself above your sport because we don't do that enough. Right. Well, thank you so much for being open and speaking. I'm so happy I finally got to have you on here. Of course, yeah, me too. <laughs> um, and I hope, I hope it was kind of relieving for you to put some things into, you know, to talk about things that maybe not yeah. everyone knows about you. Yeah, definitely. It is actually kind of a relief because there's a lot more to people's story than meets the eye and not everyone gets an opportunity to go on a podcast and just talk about it. So um, I think with that, we should all just be a little gentler and kinder to each other because you honestly do not know anyone's story or what's going on. And even if you think you do, it's just the tip of the iceberg most of the time. Um, But thank you for this opportunity. It was kind of cathartic, so I enjoyed it. Yay, well thanks Mary. Of course.